Yes, sir. He has come from Singapore all the way for this program. हमारे डॉक्टर भावलोखंडे साहब को भी गुजरिश करता को भी मंच पे आए प्रीतम बुलकुंडे और राजू हराजो भी को भी गुजरिश करता को भी मंच पे आ गए और हमारे बानाई के सचिव जयंत इंगरे साहब को गुजरिश करता को भी मंच पर आसीन हो जाए मैं गुजरिश करता हूँ हमारे मुख्य रूप से कि वे हमारे जो महापुरुष हैं, उन्हें पुष्पमाला अर्पण करें। सर, फ्लोरल ट्रिब्यूट्स तू अवर आइकॉन्स। इंग्लिश आप हाँ वो ले लेगा। Please play for all tribute to Lord Buddha. Please take your seats. आज एक साथ दो विषयों पे हमने ये व्याख्यान यहाँ पे आयोजित किए हैं पहला विषय जो है वो बुद्धिज्म के सामने साउथ एशिया में जो चुनौतियाँ हैं सामाजिक सांस्कृतिक आर्थिक इस विषय पे और दूसरा विषय जो है कि जो अभी आपके सामने नागरिकता संशोधन विधेयक जो है उस पर डॉक्टर भाव लोखंडे साहब जो है अपने वक्तव्य रखने वाले हैं सबसे पहले मैं आज के हमारे मुख्य अतिथि का स्वागत करने के लिए मंच मंच पर आसीन राजीव होड़ाप जी को विनती करता हूँ कि वो हमारे डॉक्टर कलिंगा से निरत्न जो सिंगापुर से आए हैं उनका स्वागत करेंगे ठीक है इसके बाद प्रीतम बुलकुंड जी को रिक्वेस्ट करता हूँ कि डॉक्टर भाव साहब लोखंडे का वो स्वागत करेंगे सुधा में जी आ, हमारे लक्ष्मीकांत सुधा में जिसे रिक्वेस्ट करता हूँ कि वो जयंत इंगरे साहब सेक्रेटरी बना ही इनका स्वागत करेंगे
फ्रेंड्स आज हमने काफ़ी शॉर्ट नोटिस पे इस प्रोग्राम का आयोजन किया है दोनों भी महत्वपूर्ण विषय थे हमारे बीच जो हमारे गेस्ट आए हैं डॉक्टर कलिंगा जी ये साउथ एशिया में जितनी बुद्धिस्ट कंट्रीज है विशेषता म्यांमार कंबोडिया भूटान लाओस वियतनाम इंडोनेशिया मलेशिया सिक्किम नेपाल बांग्लादेश आस यहाँ जापान यहाँ पे ये कंटिन्यूसली जो है घूमते रहते हैं और जो बुद्धिज़्म के जो कम्युनिकेशंस के नेटवर्क है जनरली क्या होता है कि हमारे यहाँ पे मीडिया का काफ़ी बड़ा रोल है लेकिन बुद्धिस्ट मीडिया में भी ये मीडिया का रोल इम्पोर्टेंट होना चाहिए और जो थ्रू आउट जो बुद्धिस्ट नेशन है वो एक मेरे हिसाब से कैसे कनेक्ट होने चाहिए एक प्लेटफॉर्म पे कैसे आने चाहिए इसके लिए वो निरंतर काम करते रहते हैं तो टुडे डॉक्टर कलिंगा जी कम हियर फॉर एन स्पीच ही ट्रैवल्ड ऑल अक्रॉस द बुद्धिस्ट नेशन एंड ही इज ट्राइंग टू गेट कनेक्टेड ऑल द बुद्धिस्ट पीपल्स वाई मीडिया सो ही इज हियर इन नागपुर यस्टरडे ही कम टू नागपुर एंड टूडे ही विजिटेड नागलोका एंड सम Uh, Buddhist peoples uh, also, and uh, after that he come here to deliver a speech for us. So he is delivering a speech on the challenges of Buddhism, uh, like socio-economical challenges of Buddhism. He is delivering a speech on this uh, subject. So I request Dr. Kalinga ji to please uh, deliver a speech. You have thirty to forty minutes. Thank you. good evening uh, and uh, i'm glad to be here uh, this is my second visit to nagpur i was here 10 years ago uh, uh, filming a documentary um, so i would like to thank uh, mr saman kamle for inviting me to speak here um, i would like to uh, talk about the socio economic and cultural challenges facing uh, buddhist in uh, across asia um now few years ago uh, prime minister narendra modi said that asia's identity is what he calls indic buddhist as much as e islam defines the identity of the arabs and christianity that of europe but in the pa past two decades in particular buddhist identity of most asian countries has been challenged by two rapidly expanding and very aggressive movements one is evangelical or pentecostal christianity and the other is wahhabi islam now i don't want to uh, paint the whole of christianity and whole of islam uh, with this threat but it's this certain grain of these two religions uh, which we need to be specific about uh so uh, buddhists across asia may not have much reservations in working on an indic buddhist or hindu buddhist identity but i you know many of you here have reservations about it uh, i will come to that later but in most buddhist countries especially in southeast asia and also sri lanka Hin hindu deities such as vishnu ganesh and indra are seen as buddhist gods and especially in thailand i was correct at once in my documentary when i said these are brahmins influence uh, a professor at chulong con university pointed out to me no it is not brahmins influence these ganesh and indra are our buddhist thai buddhist gods thai buddhist deities um, so uh, now few years ago Uh, a leading theravada buddhist monk in indonesia uh, told me when i asked what happened to the great sri vijaya civilization the buddhist civilization of indonesia of uh, java and sumatra which built uh, borobudur now he uh, said it what happened was buddhism uh, there was too much brahmanism which crept into buddhism and buddhism at one stage became a shiva cult and the buddhist monks were acting like a brahmin priest 
and also they were into all these uh, rituals uh, with Shiva and with uh, Hindu deities. And also they treated uh, the Buddhists, uh, their devotees, same way the Brahmin priests treated the other caste. So there was much resentment among Indonesian Buddhists towards the priesthood. Then came the Islamic Muslim traders who came to trade, not to, not to convert people. Um, it was a different Islamic incursion to what happened in India with the Turkish Mughal invasions. They, they came to peacefully trade with people in Southeast Asia. And uh, in the process, they started talking about Islam. And they said, in front of God, you are equal. And that appealed to people because they resented the way the Buddhist monks were acting like Brahmin priests. And that is what destroyed Buddhism. And today, Indonesia, as you know, is seen as the world's largest um, uh, Islamic country, though uh, India has more Muslims than Indonesia. Um, so I think uh, we have a lesson to learn from that experience, because same thing is happening in, uh, to Buddhism in Asia today, especially in countries like uh, Sri Lanka, uh, uh, Thailand. I see this uh, Buddhist monks in, uh, going into m black magic and various sort of rituals uh, with uh, um, basically wor worshipping uh, Hindu deities rather than uh, the Dhamma of the Buddha. So, uh, so that I would say is uh, uh, one of the um, threats from within Buddhism we are facing today. But let me go back to the Pentecostal Christian threat in particular. Uh, when a natural calamity occurs, these Christian evangelical groups have trained evangelists to go in as, uh, not as monks or pastors, but as aid workers or welfare workers, exploiting the people's misery to evangelize. The 2004 Asian tsunami was a good example where it hit uh, uh, Buddhist communities in Thailand, Sri Lanka, Hindu communities in Tamil Nadu uh, and South India, and also Muslim communities in Aceh. Uh, and a uh, lot of these Christian evangelical groups uh, went there with a lot of money in uh, large numbers, and it created religious conflict in many of these communities, which did not have, uh, where it, uh, there was no conflict before. Um, a research report I did for UNESCO, uh, with UNESCO funding, uh, two years after the tsunami, uh, that was in 2006, uh, we documented, uh, I had uh, researchers in those countries doing the research, looking at what is happening after two years, what the media is reporting about, and uh, uh, one of the things we uh, pointed out in it is the breach of international codes of practices on human humanitarian aid by Christian evangelical groups. Uh, some of them, uh, like in Thailand and in, in Sri Lanka, uh, uh, while they build houses for people who lost the houses, they have also built a, what is called a prayer center, uh, or basically a church, when there were no Christians there. They were mainly Buddhist. Uh, Muslims, of course, in Aceh didn't tell of it. Um, in 2005, uh, just about six months uh, after the tsunami hit Sri Lanka, I was in Sri Lanka and uh, I met a friend of mine who related a very interesting story. He said he went to his village in southern Sri Lanka, which was hit badly by the tsunami. And when he went to the shrine room in the temple, he saw behind the Buddha statue a whole heap of uh, uh, Bibles sing in singly stacked right behind the Buddha statue. Uh, and he got very upset. He went and asked the chief monk what is happening. He thought the chief monk has been bought over by the Christian evangelists. The chief monk said uh, what happened was the villagers who were Buddhist, uh, they came and gave him the uh, Bibles. He said when these white uh, 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 helpers, uh, welfare workers came with clothes and food for them, they also gave a single his Bible. And they said they were not interested in it. And they gave it to the monk. And monk didn't know what to do with it. He didn't want to burn them. Uh, so he just stacked it behind. Now, if he burned them, 
the Christian evangelical groups, they have their international network, social media, and uh, as well as the mainstream Western media, they would have spread the word, these extremist Buddhist monks are burning Bibles. But the fact that the Buddhist monk, because of respect to another religion and another religious script uh, text, did not want to burn the Bibles is not a story for the media, local nor the international media. And that's the challenge we are facing. Uh, and that is also one of the things I'm uh, uh, looking at with the International Buddhist Confederation. I will come to it later. Um, now, in, in Sri Lanka, uh, between 2002 and 2009, uh, NGOs have mushroom from 110 to over 400. These are Christian, with Christian leanings. Uh, these are Christian evangelical groups, but they are not coming in as churches, they come in as various NGOs, uh, some Koreans come and even set up factories, uh, like government factories or agriculture uh, businesses, but when they employ Buddhists uh, from villages, they put pressure on them to become Christians. Uh, there was a report commissioned by the All Ceylon Buddhist Congress, uh, ACBC, in 2012, and it lists many of these case studies of what they describe as unethical conversions where projects have been set up by NGOs with approvals that have been obtained fraudulently. Um, there, are, there have been uh, preschools set up by Christian NGOs in the vicinity of temples and, it, and in communities which are predominantly Buddhist. They set up these preschools as community centers. And then they, and, and uh, the temples in, the, uh, in these areas run preschools. They have been running it for a long time. But they get the teachers out of it, giving them extra, bigger salary to teach in this um, uh, preschool. So they, they are undermining the temple-run preschools. Then on the pretext of building a hostel, a church is erected in a Buddhist village. Now the thing is, um, for any religious church, mosque, temple, uh, to be set up anywhere in Sri Lanka, there's a law. You have to get uh, permission. So if you set up a church which they call a prayer center, it's illegal. Um, so uh, often when Buddhi Buddhist villagers ask the police to um, close it down, police doesn't do it because they are bribed. And uh, then sometimes the villagers go and burn it down or attack it. And then overseas you get reports, I'm sure you have heard it, that militant Buddhists are attacking churches. And actually, same thing happens uh, in Indonesia with Muslims attacking the, uh, these uh, churches as well, exactly the same thing. Uh, and then many instances, church, churches have been built in villages and towns with no Christian community to be served. Then there are industrial estates that are set up, which later turns into a church complex, and many of these have been set up by Koreans. So most of these are churches that are illegal, and approval ha has been granted for something else. The ACBC, uh, in their reports, uh, strongly warn about the lack of proper controls over charitable institutions. And they said that NGO funding needs to be tightly monitored and controlled. And um, I had, um, ad ad this is a book, uh, uh, this is a report, um, uh, research I did uh, with the help of a Sri Lankan researcher and this was funded by the World Buddhist University in Thailand which is affiliated to the World Fellowship of Buddhists looking at these uh, problems the grassroots Buddhists face in Sri Lanka uh, with the Christian evangelists and lately Wahhabi Islamists and it's, it's a socio-economic problem and we also wanted to follow this up with studies on Myanmar Cambodia and Thailand, uh, Buddhist communities, they are also facing the same issue uh, because they are poor. Uh, now in, uh, in uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Myanmar, uh, uh, the uh, majority of the poor are Buddhists, though they are also the majority of the population. Uh, so uh, now we talk about the Rohingyas in uh, uh, Myanmar. Aung San Suu Kyi gave a talk in Singapore last year where I was there. And she pointed out that uh, it's not only Muslims, there's more Buddhists in uh, Myanmar who are very poor, I in fact, poorer than the Rohingyas, who need help. 
and uh, she appealed to Singaporean businesses to come and invest in those villages to, uh, to provide economic opportunities to Buddhists as well as Muslims and other ethnic communities who are very poor. So, uh, uh, but these have been reported as uh, uh, religious conflicts when these are socio-economic issues and I'm sure you're very familiar with that, these issues with your own communities. So the Sarode leader told our researcher, that's uh, Dr. A.T. Ariratna, uh, and let me quote him. He said, they spend a lot of money and many government officials get trapped into this. They are able to set up programs through provincial administration officials and village council officials by providing them with many financial incentives. So these programs have government backing. Now this is not at national level, this is at like the Panchayat local council level and there's another uh, level of of uh, governance in Sri Lanka called province, uh, provincial administrations. There's nine provinces, like states here in, uh, to a certain extent. Um, and those systems, especially the provincial council system is very corrupt. And uh, these politicians are extremely corrupt. And they can be bought over. Uh, and, and the officials can be bought over. And that's what they are doing. They are getting permission for these schemes by paying them. Um, and also the behavior of some of the Christian evangelical groups in particular offends local uh, sentiments which drive local Buddhist communities to protest, unfortunately sometimes in aggressive fashion. Now for example, uh, you know in the Theravada Buddhism, there's what is called, uh, and the triple gem is called Trivida Ratna in uh, Sinhalese, I think it comes from Sanskrit. Um, then the Christian evangelists come and uh, um, introduce the Holy Trinity and call the same Sinhalese name, Trividaratna, to confuse the Buddhists. And then uh, there are churches, in Sinhalese we used to call Christian churches Palli, Palliya. And uh, then the Buddhist temples are Deva Rama because it's Deva Rama because there are also shrines for deities there. Deva is the deity. And these Christian uh, evangelical groups call their churches also Deva Rama. And in their rituals, they use temple drumming as well. Um, so when the Buddhists protest saying these are unethical, what they are doing, uh, uh, and they are trying to mislead the peer, Buddhist people, uh, they are often uh, labeled by the international media the, uh, as spreading hate, uh, as extremists spreading hate speech. Uh, but the activities of Christian pastors in particular, who denigrate the Buddha and Buddhism, are never mentioned in these reports, especially in the in international media. In 2005, I did a report for IPS News Agency from Sri Lanka on how the Buddhist monks party, JHU, has signed an agreement to support the presidential bid of the then uh, Prime Minister, uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa who won the presidency later. Uh, the JHU is the Jataka Hele Urmea, the uh, Buddhist monks party, uh, has been labeled in the international media as a Buddhist nationalist party. So I asked its parliamentary leader, Venerable Aturalia Ratana, are you, is your party a Buddhist nationalist party? And this is what he says, I'm translating what he says, he said, we are fighting against the negative impact of globalization on our rural Buddhist communities. We are using language and religion to mobilize our people. It is not right to call it Buddhist nationalism. So after I interviewed him, I thought 20 years before that, uh, before the fall of the Soviet Union, such, such social movements would have mobilize under the hammer and sickle emblem or the red flag of the communist. And now they are mobilizing against these socio-economic injustices using either religion or ethnicity or both because communism has been discredited. So uh, uh, the communists used to talk, uh, talk about social injusti injustices. Uh, of course they didn't re uh, refer to religion but now the monks are also talking about social in, in, injustices. 
the international media at that time would have labeled them as communist insurgencies. Now, even if you look at the Muslim world, uh, this is also true. Now, in Egypt, when it uh, became, uh, when democracy, real democracy was introduced for the first time uh, 10, 15 years ago, um, Muslim Brotherhood won the elections. Muslim Brotherhood was a socio-economic movement, which for uh, decades have been providing the poor Muslims with uh, welfare facilities uh, where, where the government has been neglecting them. So that's why they won. But they were then uh, the Americans and the international media and uh, um, uh, conservatives within uh, the military labeled them as uh, Islamic terrorists and got rid of them. Uh, so um, similar things are also happening in the Buddhist world today because of socioeconomic issues. Um, recently, Gotabe Rajapaksa won the presidency in Sri Lanka and he campaigned on a very strong Sinhala Buddhist nationalist platform. But interestingly, he didn't use Sinhala Buddhist nationalist rhetoric. He, he used language of a socialist. Um, and, um, but his election campaign was coordinated by a network of over 2,000 temples, where Buddhist monks used sermons. Uh, uh, to uh, mobilize support for his uh, presidential bid. And uh, he won the presidency there. Um, for decades, people have been saying no one can become the president of Sri Lanka without the minority vote. The minorities voted overwhelmingly for the other candidate, Sajit uh, Premadasa, 80% in the Tamil Muslim electorates. But uh, Gotabe got about 70% in the uh, 70 to 80 percent in the Sinhala Buddhist electorates, and on the national vote, he won on a landslide. Uh, he had a uh, over one and a half million uh, uh, majority, uh, uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, victories uh, in Sri Lankan presidential elections. I think it's the second biggest victory, uh, and also he, I think he also got a, uh, some of the Catholic votes as well, Sinhalese Catholic votes. Now, since his election just about a month ago. Uh, his government has been issuing policy statements and these policy statements are not about religion. It's about giving assistance to farmers, poor communities and bringing down the cost of living. Um, uh, they are focused on solving so socio-economic problems most of the poor in Sri Lanka are facing who are Buddhist. Um, so. Uh, now, these socio-economic issues could be misrepresented as religious nationalism, uh, which in turn tends to downplay the social and economic inequalities in the society, which is in fact a global problem today. Now, looking a little bit of why there is a very strong Buddhist nationalist uh, sentiments in Sri Lanka, which has been there for a long time. And it comes to the surface off and on when the uh, Buddhists feel threatened. They, they are able to mobilize. Um, now, let me g give you the reasons why the Buddhists are able to mobilize in Sri Lanka. Because though Buddhism originated in India, it was in Sri Lanka that it flourished, beginning with the introduction of the religion to the island in the third century uh, before the common era uh, by. Uh, Venerable Mahind, the, the son of Emperor Ashoka, and later his daughter, uh, Bhikkhuni Sangamitta, bought the bow, sampling of the bow tree to Sri Lanka, which is in Anuradhapura. Um, so, Sri Lanka has the world's longest unbroken Buddhist heritage. And it's interesting when uh, Prime Minister Modi came for the UN Day of Vesak about two years ago to Sri Lanka. And he said in his speech that India lost Buddhism. And it was Anagaraga Dharmapala who brought back Buddhism to India. And he acknowledged it publicly in Sri Lanka. Um, so uh, the Abhegi Mahavihara of Anuradhapura is the first ever Buddhist monastic education institution established in the first century BC in uh, Sri Lanka, and Mahavihara attracted scholars from all over the world, like what Nalanda did many centuries after. 
Over the centuries, Abhayagiri Mahavihara had to fight many battles to preserve the purity of the Theravada teachings. So, Sri Lanka claims to be the custodian of the Theravada tradition up to this date. The Buddhist canon Tripitaka was written at Aluvihara in Sri Lanka in the 1st century BC. It was this text that helped to spread Buddhism and Buddhist education systems across Southeast Asia mainly. Because there were scholars, monks from Myanmar, Cambodia, Thailand, who came to Sri Lanka because they came by boat through the Bay of Bengal um, uh, mainly. And they, they learned the Tripitaka and took it back, translated it into their languages, and it also gave rise to the very rich Buddhist education tradition in the Theravada tradition in Southeast Asia. When Polonnaru was the capital of Sri Lanka between 12th to the 13th century, it is characterized with significant technological and cultural achievement, and the development of architecture based on Buddhist influence has been a notable achievement of this period, which are called Viharas or Stupas today. Uh, so, uh, when Thailand had a war with Khmer and finally got rid of the Khmer's and created the kingdom of Siam, and they wanted to build a new capital, Sukhothai, in the 13th century, and they didn't want the Khmer architecture to um, uh, to uh, dominate it. So they invited architects from the Polonnaru, from Polonnaru in Sri Lanka to build the new capital of Sukhothai. So if you go to Sukhothai today and if you go to uh, Polonnaru today, the ruins look very similar. Um, so naturally Sri Lankan Buddhists are very proud of their Buddhist heritage and they see protecting it as a human right. Uh, very often the Westerners see human rights in an individual capacity. But we see human rights as a collective right. And we should have that right to protect our heritage from these threats, uh, uh, the new threats. So as I said, I uh, tried to, uh, we plan to follow this up with a similar study. Like Myanmar also in, is in a very similar situation. Uh, people in Myanmar are also very proud of their Buddhist heritage and, um, and uh, they want to protect it and they see a threat to it. Um, I won't go into those de details, uh, but as part of this study, I spent 10 days in Myanmar uh, last December and, um, and uh, uh, I went to interview a very uh, old monk, um, uh, he heads the new organization which was set up, you may have uh, heard about uh, Venerable Virantu, who the Time magazine said was a Buddhist terrorist. So the Aung San Suu Kyi government banned he, his movement, but they uh, their devotees set up another association which is headed by a very soft uh, spoken, a well known monk uh, which runs uh, uh, well-known uh, monastery which trains uh, hundreds of uh, Buddhist monks. And uh, when I asked him the question, uh, are you, uh, is your organization involved in hate speech? He had a bottle of uh, honey beside him. He took that bottle, showed it to me, and said, if I keep on saying this is poison, you will believe it at one stage. And that is what the international media is doing. They look at one side of the story, focus on just one, and say this is extremism, extremism, and people believe all Buddhists are extremists. And a lot of the Buddhists I met, uh, scholars, well-known scholars, leading monks, they say the media never comes and talks to us. And they, they gave me a completely different perspective, and they, they gave me a good perspective on why people in Myanmar, the Buddhists, feel threatened, same as what I related to you about Sri Lanka. Um, <coughs> So uh, now I'm involved with the International Buddhist Confederation, which is based in Delhi, and uh, we are trying to create some media and cultural projects um, to empower the Buddhists, especially to give Buddhists a stronger voice in Asia. And uh, I, w I have been funded by the Dalai Lama Foundation here to do this study about the communication needs of Buddhist communities in South and Southeast Asia, and this is part of the study I'm here and this is the last leg, India and Sri Lanka, then I'll be writing the report. 
and presenting it to the second uh, Asian Buddhist media conclave in uh, uh, Bangkok in March. And interestingly, the first conclave, uh, which was I pro proposed it at the ABC's annual general meeting uh, two years ago, and a month later, uh, official of the Ministry of Culture uh, in India said, uh, and I proposed this uh, media conference, said they will fund it. So we had the first media conference uh, last August in uh, Delhi. Now after the Modi government was re-elected, they have given more funds for the I I IBC and, uh, and uh, to have the second media conclave. So this time we are, uh, I'm organizing it with them in uh, Bangkok with Thai partners. Um, so um, you may know that the Indian government is cu currently promoting Buddhist tourism to India. B uh, and uh, I was invited and I attended last year the International Buddhist Tourism Conclave uh, funded by the Indian government. In fact, uh, my trip here was funded by the Indian government. And there, uh, there was a roundtable conference with international delegates. There were about 200 international delegates, uh, Buddhist leaders, uh, tour agents. Uh, and uh, it was chaired by the Ministry of, uh, Minister of Tourism. I think he's from Kerala. Um, and one of the delegates from Malaysia pointed out to him that uh, India has a problem in promoting Buddhist tourism because the Buddhist sites they are promoting don't have Buddhist communities. Uh, the Buddhist temples there are mainly run by, by foreign uh, governments or foreign mon monasteries. Uh, so uh, then he pointed out in Southeast Asia, if you uh, go to all these Buddhist sites, pilgrim sites or historical sites, there's Buddhist communities around that. There, are, there is a Buddhist culture and uh, there are Buddhist festivals. So he said, if you are really going to succeed in this, you have to create local Buddhist communities in Buddha Gaya, in Kushinara, uh, Sanchi, and all those areas. I know, I'm sure you know these areas. It's Muslim or Hindu communities who are there. So uh, um, I, I was in Sikkim in August. Now, Sikkim is an interesting place. Uh, in Sikkim, as you may know, it used to be a Buddhist kingdom when India annexed it in the 1970s during Ms. Indira Gandhi's time. Uh, so in Sikkim, there are Buddhist monasteries everywhere. I visit many of them. And they are surrounded by Buddhist communities. They have Buddhist festivals. These are Indian Buddhist festivals, okay, not Tibetan festivals. In fact, Sikkimis say Sikkimese Buddhism predates Tibetan Buddhism because Buddhism, when it went from India to Tibet, went through Sikkim. So it was first took root in Sikkim before it went to uh, uh, in, uh, uh, Tibet. So now I found that the state government there is giving money to monasteries to build guest houses for visitors and encourage them to design programs such as a two or five day retreats to introduce Buddhism and the unique Sikkimese Buddhist culture to visitors so that they will spend a few days in the area. Uh, so, um, so if the Indian government is to develop a thriving Buddhist pilgrim and tourism circuit, it needs to develop Buddhist villages around Buddhist pilgrim and historic sites. Inviting foreign monasteries to build temples is not the way to go. And I'm sure your Buddhist community here uh, would need to look at it and maybe come up with ideas. Uh, now, um, uh, Nagpur as far as I know, is part of is not part of this Buddhist circuit they are promoting. So, first thing would be to get Nagpur also into this circuit. Nagpur uh, at least have a Buddhist community here, like in Sikkim. But then maybe some of your followers could set up villages, communities in Buddha Gaya. In uh, I met in Buddha Gaya, uh, uh, Buddhist leader, former former Dalit. Uh, um, and he was very critical. He said there's about 12 people there. I think Siddhartha Nagar or some place near Mahabodhi. They don't get any assistance uh, from the Indian government. So um, uh, I hope the Ambedkar Buddhist 
uh, followers play a re leading role uh, in, uh, in this uh, in association with the Indian government agencies to create Buddhist communities. Um, now they, they were promoting uh, new sites, uh, historic sites they have found in Andhra Pradesh, I think, or Telangana, the new uh, new state. But they are just showing the monuments, and then they told the international delegation uh, that land is available to set up monasteries. But this is for foreigners to come. They should, I thought they should have offered this land to Buddhist communities to come and establish new communities there. Um, so, uh, okay, coming back to the threats to Buddhism in Asia, um, uh, now I mentioned about the, the uh, uh, internal divisions. Uh, uh, now, until, unless we tackle the internal problem of this ritualistic Buddhism, uh, the black magic, the uh, deity cults and things like that, um, uh, there, Buddhism could be threatened from inside. There, there are monks uh, who act like uh, swamis uh, with cults. Uh, there are some monks I know in Sri Lanka, they even have been to Australia to run weekend workshops on people, uh, how to become arahants. And he, came, see, he's, uh, he claims he's a arahant. <laughs> and, and these are money-making ventures. <coughs> now, I would also argue that the socioeconomic problems of grassroots Buddhists could only, only be resolved by socially engaged Buddhism. Um, we have to apply Buddhist practices into everyday life, especially into development schemes. Um, and uh, so, uh, uh, and um, also Buddhists, especially in East Asia and Southeast Asia, are not poor. There's a lot of very rich Buddhists. But they, are, they need to help Buddhists. Um, now, there are uh, I have seen some of these uh, very rich Buddhist foundations. They are mainly helping. They are giving out thousands and thousands of dollars, some uh, uh, tens of thousands of dollars, to Buddhist communities in faraway, uh, non-Buddhist communities in faraway countries, even in Europe and North America, uh, because they want to show how comp compassionate Buddhists are, and they are not even uh, they are not doing this for proselytization. Okay good to show that, but when there is such a need to empower socio-economically Buddhist communities across Asia, I feel they need to concentrate on Buddhist communities first. One, one such organization is Taiwan's Tushi Foundation, uh, which uh, I don't know, do they operate here? Do they have any projects here? Okay. Uh, now, they have some 53 centers in the US and many in Australia. And when I went to Indonesia a few months ago, they had a huge building in Jakarta. Uh, uh, very, uh, it would have cost them millions of dollars to build that headquarters in Indonesia. But they are working among Muslim communities. They are um, building schools. They are doing some good work. But not, uh, of course, the Buddhists in Indonesia are a minority, uh, Chinese, but they are rich. Uh, now, they themselves, um, now, some of this, uh, there's a Buddhist organization called Walubi which is made up of rich uh, Indonesian business people who are Buddhist. And they are actually, they are willing to help Buddhist communities when I spoke to them in other countries. Um, now, Tushi has set up this uh, big uh, operation, but not to help Buddhists. Then there is, uh, now I'm on the mailing subscriber list for a US-based uh, Buddhist um, aid agency called called Global Buddhist Relief, which is run by Bhikkhu Bodhi. That uh, uh, is an American Buddhist monk who spent many years in Sri Lanka, uh, who dish out hundreds of thousands of dollars each year for development projects across the globe. Now, I have noted there also that most of these grants are given out to non-Buddhist communities, especially in Africa. Of course, they deserve the help, no doubt, but there are many other international agencies that help this communities as well. Buddhist communities who need this type of help in Asia often don't have the international networking to lobby for and attract these funds. So that's also very important that we identify these uh, 
organizations lobby them uh, make good uh, proposals and try and get their funds into Buddhist communities to uh, for uh, socio-economic empowerment uh, I don't know if you get any assistance from global Buddhist relief no from any Buddhist uh, foundations in Nothing at all. <laughs> yeah, that's something you may have to look into. Uh, now, uh, the Thai Buddhist social critic Sulak Sivaraksa, uh, some of you may know him, he often referred to the structural violence of the global economic system for the socio-economic problems facing the poor in Asia. He has been critical of Buddhists for not being socially engaged to help resolve poverty issues facing grassroots Buddhists in Asia. I have met him many times and he says both Thailand and Sri Lanka practice capital B Buddhism, capitalist and nationalist, not socially engaged Buddhism. Now also, if you look at it, we don't have Buddhist leaders in Asia who articulate boldly the injustices of the global economic system as Pope Francis often does. Actually, I, I have become a fan of Pope. Pope Francis, because he was a, what is called in the Catholic Church, liberation uh, theologist, who were uh, uh, some uh, those days uh, seen as leftist, communist uh, priests. So they were, were engaged Buddhism, and what some of these Jesuit priests do on the ground are very similar. Um, now, uh, Suvaraksa uh, said once, the weakness of Buddhism in Southeast Asia is that Buddhists do not deal with the power structures. In fact, Buddhists, uh, I find, are very reluctant to talk about power structures. Uh, now, Su Sulak argues that globalization and free market fundamentalism are what he called demon demonic religions, that is, imposing materialistic values across the world. Now, unlike the Catholic Church, for example, Buddhist scholars and leaders are not really questioning this economic system and its social injustices. And I, I haven't heard Dalai Lama talking about it. If he can, if he talks a bit more about it, that will that uh, his words have clout, uh, uh, both within the Buddhist community says, and in the international community. And often the Buddhists say, when I raise this with Buddhists, uh, especially in places like Singapore, even Thailand, and many other places in Southeast Asia, they say, oh, everything is in your head. Uh, if you purify your uh, uh, head, mind, uh, through meditation, uh, everything will lo uh, look good. Okay. So, so many say this is all in your head. Why do you want to confront these things? But sometimes I feel this is a selfish attitude. Uh, and sometimes I find this in Western Buddhists this attitude. In fact, I found when I was in Australia, when they come to Buddhism, they don't come through dana and sila. They come directly to bhavana. Now, bhavana is for self-improvement. Uh, so I found that to be a very selfish attitude to Buddhism sometimes. But then I know some monks uh, who have pointed out to me uh, that after they get into Buddhism and start listening to sermons, they naturally come to dana. Um, we are in the Asian culture. Uh, people grow up with this dana culture, but sometimes they are reluctant to meditate. <laughs> so so uh, when you look at these socioeconomic problems, uh, there's uh, no point always protesting about others. Buddhists need to devise ways of empowering the grassroots Buddhist community, socio-economically and culturally. Now, uh, this morning I was in Nagaloka, uh, the training center. Now, I think that is the type of uh, uh, training we need for Buddhist communities and type of encouragement to be more socially active. Activist Buddhists, not exactly political, but in a socio-economic way to train them using the Buddha Dharma. So I, I had a long chat and I was quite impressed with the way they were looking at it. So I hope we can create networks like that across the Buddhist world to train Buddhist people, especially young people. Um, now, uh, other thing is the Buddhists need to develop a strong media network, both domestically and internationally, to convey news about Buddhist countries from a Buddhist perspective, like how Al Jazeera does for Muslims. 
there are many Buddhist media across Asia, but I have seen in my research, uh, most of this Buddhist media is a monk sitting in front of a camera and giving a sermon for about an hour. And <laughs> even the TV networks themselves say very few people watch this, uh, except very old people. You can't reach the young people with this type of media. So we have to come up with, now there are social media technology tools available. It doesn't cost us a lot of money uh, to create this media. Not like those days when uh, analog technology was there. So, uh, uh, so th these networks are mainly the monks sitting in front of a camera or chanting, hours of chanting being broadcast. Um, and sometimes they may cover Buddhist ceremonies, festivals, and other events. But it's merely showing rituals. Uh, hardly any di discussion programs, uh, um, news, uh, news programs, uh, looking at the uh, socioeconomic conditions of Buddhist countries. Um, in uh, 2015 to 2000, uh, sorry, 2016 to 2017, I was involved with a project at Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok. In fact, I proposed the project to them and helped them to get funding from UNESCO, a UN agency, to develop curriculum to train Asian journalists. And we developed the curriculum using philosophical concept drawn from Asian philosophy, uh, Buddhism, Confucius, and Hinduism, but most of it, uh, uh, at least 80% of it came from uh, Buddhism, and especially um, Vipassana uh, um, uh, tradition and also the Panchasila uh, co concepts. Uh, a book was published out of that project by Sage called uh, Mindful Communication for Sustainable Development Perspectives from Asia, and a number of Asian scholars from around Southeast Asia, even Japan and uh, is, uh, South Asia were involved in it, and they had chapters in it giving various uh, ideas o on how mindful communication could be adopted to development communication. And currently, I'm working in association with IBC to introduce such courses across Asia to train development communicators. Um, Shantiniketan Vishwabhati Shantiniketan is interested. Just two days ago, I gave a lecture at Amiti University in uh, Delhi. And the head of the school there is Indian Buddhist, uh, Professor Gauri Ch uh, Chakraborty. And she's very keen on this idea as well. Uh, and there's a uh, university in Sri Lanka, Lumbini University in Lumbini, uh, Lumbini Buddhist University. And there's a number of universities who are in, uh, interested. So we are trying to set up a network of training. Um, maybe Nagaloka also could uh, be part of it. Uh, so that we train what we call communicators. We don't want to call journalists because we feel that journalism we practice today is too divisive. It creates conflict. And what we are doing, bringing in Asian uh, philosophy into training communicators is to communicate, to promote cooperation and harmony in the society rather than divisions and conflict. So we, it will be a long process, but we hope we can start somewhere and go up uh, to, uh, uh, to create this culture of communication. And, uh, uh, and also, we are, there, there is, um, we are also working on an IPTV channel uh, in the English language, a regional channel. This is also, I'm working with uh, uh, IBC and uh, Lotus Communication Network, which I set up. And, uh, we want to, it's, what we are looking at is setting up a consortium of Buddhist television networks. Now, I hope Pawas TV also would become a part of it. Uh, there's uh, Bodhi TV in uh, Nepal is interested, BuddhaNet in uh, Myanmar, uh, the Buddhist channel in Sri Lanka, Thai public service broadcasting. And uh, we are also hoping to have small units of production bases, and we train these producers in mindful communication for sustainable development, and then let them go out and uh, uh, use those principles in gathering news and packaging news. Um, so that's something I'll be involved in working with a number of people in the region, Buddhist communicators, in the coming years. Now, another serious problem facing Buddhism in Asia is the 
drifting away of young Asians from Buddhism. This is young uh, uh, youngsters in their teenage years, um, in their twenties, uh, who are from Buddhist families. I, I have seen it. Um, it's happening in large scale in uh, um, Singapore, for example, uh, and it's happening in ba Bangkok as in uh, Thailand as well. I mean, especially South uh, Southeast Asia. They say they see Buddhism as too ritualistic, sometimes even superstitious, and not cool enough for their modern lifestyle. Because now, when I was teaching at the Polytechnic in Singapore many a few years, uh, more than 10 years ago, I used to have Chinese students, when we talk about relig religious identities and things like that in communication courses, they say we are free thinkers. And then I find many of them come from Buddhist families, but they don't want to identify as Buddhists. Um, because um, uh, some of them I have privately talked to them and said Buddhists are free thinkers and why Buddhists are free thinkers. I talk about Kalama Sutra and many other things. But they say that is not the Buddhism our parents have taught us. They take us to the temple when we were children, uh, offer joysticks, uh, flowers, uh, chant things in a language we don't understand, often Pali, um, and then do chanting also in Pali, which they don't understand, for hours. And they say, oh, do just do it to get merit. And when they come to a certain age, they say, what merit are we getting <laughs> out of this? <laughs> but, but then the Christians come and tell, oh, this is all superstitions, uh, idol, idol worships. Uh, and, and then they come with their gospel music. And if you go to their uh, um, church services, it's like a pop concert. And it attracts these young people. So uh, I feel we need to learn the lessons from the Christ, uh, Christian evangelists and package Buddhism in a cool way. Um, so we need to um, uh, use uh, music. Now I had done a, a video clip with a Sri Lankan musical group. Uh, we use this virindu rhythm. Virindu rhythm is that rabana they use. The beat is like rap, but it's a very traditional rhythm. And we have taken the Singhalavada Sutra uh, and translated it into Singhala and not used the word Buddhist or Buddha in the lyrics, but about how the Buddha advised young person to develop true friends. So the song is called True, true Friends. And the song is sung in Singhalese to that Virindu rhythm, but uh, when I did the video clip, I have subtitled it in English. So it can go over the cultures. And this is also something we want to do with that TV channel we are working on. Uh, the songs could be in Marathi or whatever language. Uh, we subtitle it in English and try to take it over cultures with nice beats. Uh, so we have to try those and see how it works. Uh, it has worked for evangelical Christianity. <laughs> and I'm sure it, we could make it work for Buddhism as well. Um, because now, I have, uh, I have also had, had criticism. Some Sri Lankans have said, oh, you are trying to uh, introduce party Buddhism. <laughs> You're trying to dilute the Buddhist uh, traditions, which are based on the chanting of Pirit and all this. So I said, this is, we are taking Buddhism to popular culture, not necessarily singing this in temples. Okay, we are taking it to television. We are taking it to concerts, um, not in, um, you can still have the Buddhist traditions in the temples. Now, I met a uh, monk in Cambodia in my research. Um, he's in his 30s, and he's very popular in Cambodia with young people, and he used a Facebook. And he explained to me how he used short video clips uh, on Facebook, you know, sometimes about one minute, and get young people interested in the philosophy. Then when he um, organize something in the temples, he see young people coming. Uh, first he doesn't say it is Buddhism. Uh, later when they find out, when they first get attracted to the, to the message and find out it's Buddhism, then they have no hesitation to come to temple and even get sit and listen to some period chanting and take the Panchasila. Because when they take the Panchasila, they know what they're taking. Okay, now uh, I was at Chulongkorn University teaching a class I wanted to use the Panchasila concepts to teach them how to use it to investigate and report on corruption. 
Now, if you look at the five Panchasila uh, principles, it covers corruption. Okay. But when I ask, pa what is Panchasila? There are 38 in the class, three were Muslims, others all claim Buddhists. They didn't know what Panchasila is. Then uh, I asked them, when you go to temple, you recite Kamechu Michachara, Majapa Madatana, Surame Majapa. They say, yes, we, then one student said, yes, we recite. But they don't know what it is. <laughs> and then I asked, so why do you do it? He said, uh, to get merit. So I said, <laughs> you can't get merit unless you practice it. Okay. So that is the weakness we have in this traditions in Theravada Buddhism, especially we practice. So that Panchasila, uh, as a tradition you do, it has to be taken out and in various forms given to young people as a ethical, moral uh, practice. Then um, uh, I am not uh, averse to using uh, the period in song forms. Because we listen to Pirit, we say it calms your mind and all these things. But it has so much material in it, so many much good messages in it. Why cannot we do songs or teledramas, uh, video clips uh, about this Mangala Sutra and all these sutras? Uh, uh, then uh, even I'm thinking of uh, the Dhammapada, each verse could be presented in 30 to 60 second audio visual clip uh, for to attract young people. So uh, now I, I saw something very interesting uh, in Thailand last year on uh, New Year's Eve. Um, because I, I was attending a Buddhist conference there. We were taken to a temple which had um, thousands of people on New Year's Eve, when the New Year dawned on 31st December, chanting and listening uh, and uh, listening to sermons from the monks. And, uh, and I was surprised, they were all dressed in white, and a lot of them were young people. And when I asked the Thais, they said, why that happens is the television networks there have promoted it as a cool thing to do on New Year's Eve rather than going out, getting drunk, dance, and <laughs> uh, uh, welcome the new year. So because the television networks got in, packaged it, and presented it as a cool thing to do, the young people were coming with their parents or on their own. Sometimes like couples uh, were there. So that's something also we should see how we can uh, uh, package as fashionable these uh, uh, traditional things we do. Um, so what is stopping us is not technology, but funds. That's the important thing. Uh, how do you get this funded? Because um, uh, now, for example, that news uh, project I mentioned to um, train the people, we need funds to bring them together, train, or I'm thinking of uh, to make it cheaper to do online training package. Um, but still you need funds for that. And then also you will need funds for them to go out and do the reporting. And what I have found is uh, it's much more easier to get money from uh, rich Buddhists to build a huge Buddha statue or a very lavish temple because they have always been told that this, is, this gives them good merit for the next life. So I, <laughs> I asked the leading Sri Lankan monk uh, recently, can you devise some sermons? Uh, to tell the people that uh, uh, funding media projects, social media projects to empower Buddhists also gives you good merit for the next life. <laughs> and that, that's the role for the monks. <laughs> I think we have to uh, get them involved. Um, so, uh, yeah. Now, one other project uh, also we are doing with IBC. Mm. Uh, you may be interested in this uh, because at the first media conclave last uh, August, uh, there were three resolutions we adopted. One was the IPTV channel, uh, one other one was the uh, uh, mindful communication uh, networking of training, and the third one was to develop a Nalanda Arts Festival, an annual festival of Buddhist arts to be held in Nalanda 
where we bring in Buddhist artists from across Asia. Uh, artists means not only musicians, singers, but sculptures, uh, even uh, we can have some uh, even film festival, filmmakers, um, uh, draw, uh, painters, Buddhist painters, whoever are involved in various forms of Buddhist cultural expressions. So start off maybe on a smaller scale and then every year we have it. And yesterday I had a meeting in uh, Delhi with IBC to discuss the media projects and uh, we decided that uh, we will aim for mid-December next year as the uh, first festival and I have been assigned to do the proposal and we discuss about its focus and uh, they are quite confident they can get the Bihar government and the Indian government to give the co-funding for it on the, on the concepts we, we are promoting uh, because it will link India and Nalanda with the Buddhist community through arts and it has some link to Nalanda University. Uh, so, so I hope this works out and uh, the community here and uh, I know you, have, you also have good uh, um, artists can get uh, involved in it. So let me finish uh, with this comment which I may <laughs> make all the time that if we don't uh, get involved in this socio-economic issues um, uh, to empower the community through culture, through, uh, uh, through media and uh, through other development work and fund these projects, Buddhists themselves fund it and we keep on building these big temples <laughs> everywhere. Uh, in 100 years times we will have a lot of monuments like Borobudur, great temples but these will be historic monuments, not shrines anymore because there's no Buddhist communities uh, around there for it. So th th this is the challenge we are facing and I will <laughs> finish on that note. Thank you very much. Thank you Dr. Kalinga ji. If we try to summarize a short way, what is the challenge of South Asian Buddhism and what is the challenge of this? They have told us about it and in this way, इन सारे बुद्धिस्ट देशों में उन्होंने अपनी यात्राएं भी की हैं तो उनका ये कहना है कि जिस तरह से भारत में ये कहा जाता है कि बुद्ध है विष्णु का नववा अवतार इस तरह की एक मान्यता है तो मोस्टली श्रीलंका और थाईलैंड में भी इसी तरह का कुछ एक वातावरण है कि वहाँ पे इंद्र देव या फिर कुछ और भगवान होते हैं उनको भी मान्यता है कि वो लोग उन्हीं के ही भगवान इस तरह का और ब्लैक मैजिक के बारे में भी कुछ लोग काफ़ी कंफ्यूज है तो कुछ बुद्धिज्म में कंफ्यूजन है स्पेशली साउथ ईस्ट बुद्धिज्म में श्रीलंका की बात करें या थाईलैंड की बात करें या वियतनाम की बात करें साथ ही साथ सर ने यह भी कहने की कोशिश की कि जो रिच बुद्धिस्ट एन जी है वो अलग अलग देशों में काम करते हैं अलग अलग कम्युनिटीज़ के लिए काम करते हैं लेकिन जो बुद्धिस्ट कम्युनिटीज़ हैं उनके लिए वो काम नहीं करती उन्होंने खंत भी जताई कि जो बहुत सारे बुद्धिस्ट बिजनेसमैन हैं अच्छे अच्छे जगह पे हैं और वो अपना हर साल डॉलर्स में पैसा देते हैं लेकिन वो बुद्धिस्ट एक्टिविटीज़ के लिए नहीं देते ये इनका एक दिक्कत है साथ ही साथ इन्होंने ये भी कहा कि जो बुद्धिज़म को भी बढ़ाना है हमें आने वाले दिनों में क्योंकि ये यही एक ऐसा धम्म है कि जो इस देश इस पूरे जगत में शांति प्रस्तावित कर सकता है तो इसके लिए बुद्धिस्ट जो मीडियाज है अलग अलग देशों में उन्हें भी इकट्ठा लाने की और उनमें उनके अंदर भी एक कम्युनिकेशन डेवलप करने की एक कोशिश संवाद करने की कोशिश डॉक्टर कलिंगा कर रहे हैं और उनका ये कहना है कि जिस तरह से हम केवल देखते हैं कि एक बुद्धिस्ट मंग सामने आता है टीवी पे और वो केवल स्पीच देते रहता है लेकिन इसके अलावा भी बुद्धिज्म में काफ़ी अच्छी बातें हैं जो हम कह सकते हैं अलग अलग ऑडियो वीडियो फॉर्म में कह सकते हैं धमोपत की बातें हो या कुछ थाट्स हो या फिर अलग अलग विषय हो तो इसको भी वो लोग एलेबोरेट करने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं कि इस माध्यम से भी वो लोगों को जन जागृति करें श्रीलंका ने बुद्धिज्म के सामने क्या चैलेंजेस है इस पर भी उन्होंने बात की और कहा कि लास्ट टाइम श्रीलंका में बॉम्ब ब्लास्ट भी हुए थे इसके बाद सारे श्रीलंकन बुद्धिस्ट कम्युनिटी इकट्ठा हुई और फिर उन्होंने जो है अपना ही एक बंदा जो चुना है राष्ट्रपति भी बने वो भी प्राइम मिनिस्टर भी वही बन गए और इसके माध्यम से जो है श्रीलंका के जो बुद्धिज्म को थ्रेट था उसको दूर करने की कोशिश की है साथ ही इन्होंने नालंदा आर्ट फेस्टिवल करने की बात कही है कि जो बुद्धिज्म ने कलाएं विकसित की है जो आर्किटेक्चर जो बुद्ध सबसे पहले अगर आर्किटेक्चर अगर कहीं से स्टार्ट हुआ तो बुद्धिज्म से स्टार्ट हुआ तो इसको भी रिवाइव करने की आवश्यकता है क्योंकि आज तो अलग अलग तरह के आर्ट सबको नजर आते हैं लेकिन बुद्धिस्ट आर्ट सबसे ट्रेडिशनल सबसे पुराना आर्ट्स है तो इसको भी जिंदा रखने की कोशिश हम लोगों ने करनी चाहिए और एक्टिव और सोशल बुद्धिज्म में यकीन रखना चाहिए साथ ही साथ इनका ये भी कहना है कि 
काफ़ी सारे यंगस्टर जो होते हैं जो विशेषतः साउथ एशियन बुद्धिज्म के हैं कि वो क्रिश्चनिटी की तरफ भी आकर्षित हो रहे हैं हमारे यंगस्टर्स तो उन्हें कैसे रोका जाए और या फिर आ, हमारे जो बुद्धिज्म की जो ट्रेडिशंस है इसमें अगर कुछ मॉडिफिकेशन हम कर सकते हैं तो इस पर भी हमने सोचना चाहिए तो इस पर पर भी एक काम कर रहे हैं तो एक अच्छा था एक थाट जो है सर ने दिया है हम हमारा नेक्स्ट सेशन की तरफ जाएंगे और नेक्स्ट जो सेशन हम करने वाले हैं वो 